All right. Is David joining us today? Do you know? Yes. He's on line. Oh, okay, good. I'll start with this one. This is a patient who came into an outside hospital this summer, and he had recently been diagnosed with prostate cancer, hadn't had a metastatic workup, but was having worsening shortness of breath. And I think you can see on the PE study done outside why he's probably, at least what part of what's contributing to his shortness of breath. So he has a large hydrothorax on the left, and I think you can see there's subtle, fairly smooth pleural thickening here. And one question I have for you guys, just in terms of semantics, because I know David is not necessarily a fan of tension pneumothorax, especially in the setting of when you have a pneumothorax and you just have shift or, or rotation of the mediastinum, as he would say, because of the loss of the basically adhesive properties of that lung and the elastic recoil of the other lung. But in this case, would you all consider this to be at least some degree of tension hydrothorax since there's basically inversion of the diaphragm and the mediastinum being pushed or, or forced to rotate to the right here? Yeah, I think so. I find, I mean, I find that like the tension hydrothorax is a tough thing because I don't know if these patients actually have you know, any sort of or significant hemodynamic compromise from it, but it certainly looks like there's mass effect from it in this case. But anyway, he underwent a tap. It was bloody. They drained like three liters of fluid and it was bloody, but it was non, never grew anything and didn't have any cells in it. So, but of course, in an outpatient with an unexplained effusion, I think in, uh, an infection, paranemonic or empyema or cancer are going to be the two most common things to think about. This was a repeat radiograph, and you can see the fluid has reaccumulated. And then he finally came back after a couple of taps, at least two negative cytologies, and we saw him. And now he's got a hydro pneumothorax on that side. And you can see that it's fairly smooth pleural thickening. Uh, so usually we think about something infectious, but he again had nothing, in, no infectious symptoms the whole time. Had some small effusion or small anterior diaphragmatic lymph nodes, and they we ended up recommending they do a pleural biopsy just because you know there was still no diagnosis, and this did turn out to be a mesothelioma, right. and it was it was a um, I think it was a biphasic on the final path, but there was yeah biphasic mesothelioma. Uh, so I think it's it's always a reminder, you know, negative cytology on a on a thoracentesis does not mean the patient doesn't have cancer because it's it depends on where you look in the literature, but somewhere around 60, 70, 80 percent sensitive in these yeah, cases. I think but, it's also important to point out that the pathologist can't make a diagnosis of mesothelioma on cytology because they need to see the cells actually invading the extrapleural fat or mediastinal fat. That's a that's a very good point too, and the the group yeah. in, the group in Ottawa has done some nice work in their um, ultrasound guided uh, biopsies. You don't necessarily need to go to surgery; they just come in uh, parallel to the chest wall um, and get a chunk of pleura with with some extra pleural fat to show the invasion. Do you think that this would be too thin? Because we've done that at the VA when it's more you know discreet and mass like. Right. Um, I think it would be worth taking a look with ultrasound if you can get a tissue plane. I have, I've personally not done one, but uh, they seem to do them. And, you know, there's that rate, the potential of seeding the, the, the entrance site. And it's, the literature shows it's, slow, it's the lowest with, uh, with a core needle biopsy versus um, larger instrumentation. Yeah. So, gentlemen, uh, I've not heard this business before that you can't make a diagnosis of mesothelioma without showing invasion because um you know i think if the site if this if the immune cytochemistry on the site on the cytologic specimen is okay i think it's a mesothelioma um so i you know jeff I, are you absolutely sure about that because that's not that's I'm, not experience i've had around here or with i'm with pretty sure i mean i'm not a hundred percent but i i mean i know we've seen cases where the pathologist specifically was showing the invasion, because my understanding, and I'll definitely look into this, is that the reactive mesothelial cells look the same. Hmm. I mean, well, there I are think, stains, but I don't know how. Well, I, you know, I, have, 
I have seen cytologic interpretations that indicate they don't know whether it's reactive or whether it's uh, malignant. So you know, I think that that part might be true, but um, these things are not always invasive. So um, I, I I just I I don't think that that squares with some of the diagnosis of mesothelioma that I mm-hmm. that I have seen. Well, I just found so, uh, one article from 2015 in Cyto Journal, um, and the mm-hmm. and it's from the Inter- International Mesothelioma Interest Group and the International Academy of Cytology, um, and um, what they their statement in this in the opening is that accumulating evidence now indicates that the cytological diagnosis of mesothelioma supported by ancillary techniques is as reliable as that based on histopathology, although the sensitivity may be lower. So maybe there are some newer things, but um, and maybe it depends on the lab and on the pathologist, but. I, in general, I think they like to see <clears throat> the tissue, but I mean, you, you raise a good point. Oh, but I, I agree with you that they, they do definitely prefer um, biopsies to cytology. Yeah. And then in, in the case, like I just showed, they had at least two negative you know, cytologic analyses on the outside. And I think, you know, at that point, especially if you have an unexplained effusion with any sort of thickening and it was bloody, you know, to go to a, to to some sort of other test, like a surgical lung biopsy. Yeah. And they also specified that that only works for epithelioid types. That mm. the diagnosis of sarcomatoid mesothelioma can rarely be established by effusion cytology. So maybe that's why they just prefer tissue. Um, All right. I, I see that Seth is on here. I've got a couple of, of congenitals that I'm going to go into cool. now. This is a five-day-old, and this was I, a couple of weeks ago, and I don't think Seth was on when I showed the patient that had intracardiac total anomalous pulmonary venous return, where essentially this, the interatrial septum was formed. It was just leftward deviated, where all of the pulmonary veins returned into the right atrium. In this case, this is another, we've had a rash of these cases recently, but you can see here that there's, uh, the, the patient has a left-sided aortic arch, and this was actually not diagnosed on a prenatal ultrasound, and they thought that the pulmonary veins returned normally, and of course, the patient was was uh, not doing well at birth. And you can see the pulmonary veins do drain into this structure that is posterior to the left atrium, but it never really connects to the left atrium, and it connects to the, 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 uh, the right atrium via the coronary sinus. So this was another instance of total anomalous pulmonary venous return, and in this case, this was just directly into the coronary sinus and then into the right atrium. And so they were able to go in, they, they baffled these into the left atrium and reconnected the, or reconstructed the interatrial septum. But uh, this was just a different type of, of TAPVR and they had you know, a little stretched PFO or atrial secundum defect that was what was supplying the right to the left atrium in this case. So this is not a, you know, overly complicated case, but I set, I used that one to set up this one, which also came in recently and is, is a very cool case because a couple months ago, it was right around the holidays, I showed a patient, which I'd never seen before, where the left carotid artery came off of the pulmonary artery. And in this case, you'll see that this this is another patient. I don't know if it has, if they have DeGeorge or not. Uh, they still haven't been worked up. They've, or it, they probably have, I just haven't found the results. This was from a few months ago, though, and you'll see they thought on prenatal echo in this patient that there were bilateral patent ductus arteriosa, uh, arteriosus. Here you can see that there's a right aortic arch and there's a right ductus arteriosus here. And when you look at the arch vessels, you see that there's a right common carotid and right subclavian artery arising from that right arch. But the um, the curious thing was the fact that the left common carotid and left subclavian artery in this case didn't arise from a right aortic arch or left aortic arch because there's no double aortic arch but they are arising from the left pulmonary artery itself so this was similar to that one it's just this is an anomalous left brachiocephalic artery then if you will this whole thing then bifurcating but this patient also had partial anomalous pulmonary venous return and their interatrial septum is very similar to that case I showed a couple of weeks ago where you can see how it's just deviated leftward in this case. And here, the right-sided pulmonary veins still drain right of that septum into the what is the right atrium. 
So those are the ones that are anomalous and then left sided one strain left side into what is the left atrium. So it's kind of a, a it's an interesting combination of of several different variants that I've shown in you know the past few weeks on these congenital cases. That's good. And that's, I think that's that, I've seen um, these isolated arteries, um, but not a left brachiocephalic artery. That's pretty fascinating. That is so, fascinating. so Seth, would you at this point would you call it isolated, or if this oh. if and when this ductus closes, then it becomes because there probably is a left ductus that is what's supplying this. And then if this regresses, then it becomes isolated, right? Because we've seen that in, in adults occasionally, or at least isolated left subclavian. Yeah, or, I don't know at what point it becomes technically isolated um, if it's coming off the LPA, you know, when you have systemic arterial supply off the pulmonary artery. I'm not sure at what point it's technically termed isolated, but it's a, it's a, it's a cool case. And then this this one, they did go in and reconstruct. It's interesting. Yeah, the, basically the the interatrial septum was reasonably well formed in this case, so they reconstructed that, moved it to reimplant the pulmonary veins, and then just took this the uh, the left brachiocephalic vein, the common origin, and plugged it back into that right arch. And the patient's been doing reasonably well from that uh, since then. All right, this one is a, a nice quick radiograph case. And this is one where I think we see stuff like this not infrequently. And you can see there's this ovoid opacity posterior to the heart, posterior to the breast shadow that we see here. And it has an incomplete border. We don't see an inferior margin to it when you look on the lateral. And clearly this was done elsewhere because it's flipped from what we usually do. It looks like it's either abutting or rising from the diaphragm or you know, that it's going to be some sort of boctolic hernia. So the question is, when you guys encounter stuff like this, you know, would you be comfortable saying that this is a boctolic hernia you know, when you see these things, or do you usually push for more evaluation? Okay. Um. And I know in this case, it's a leading question. Well, because I would, this one is, you know, usually they're they're more broad based than this. Yours is I don't know. Yours looks yeah. It's a this it's a little bit more lateral. I guy would just call boctolect hernia. Sometimes you see, if I just had a sort of a broad based bump there, and then I'd it looked more you know extra pulmonary kind of thing. I'd probably yeah. I um I don't I I, I would be a little um, hesitant on this case because it's too far lateral. It should be more medial for a boctolect. And not only that, but the left hemidiaphragm is not flowing into this thing on the lateral view. It actually seems to have a sort of abrupt transition there from the curve right here to this thing. That makes me suspicious that this could be something like a fibrous tumor of the pleurus sitting back there and not really um, not really a boctolic, but I'm willing to be wrong. Well, yeah, I, I think while you're willing to be wrong, you're exactly correct. This is a fibrous tumor, and I think it's a, you know, it's a classic example of one too. You, I think that most of the vessel, most of the vasculature is coming. It's actually wrapping around and supplying this thing, you know, from one of these vessels in here. But yeah, David, that's exactly what this turned out to be. I think sometimes, you know, we like to just blow off stuff back here as, as, you know, just a diaphragmatic hernia or whatever. I think for all the reasons we've outlined, that it certainly makes me. Un uncomfortable, and of course, this is one that was all done outside before the seat, or before it was taken out here. So, you know, we didn't have the chance to see, but certainly makes me nervous and makes me think twice before you just call everything that's back there a boctolac. And I think the point of that, about it being lateral is a good one. So, this was a fibrous tumor. I'll show. Let's see, I'll do one more quick one, just because this one did. This one I did see recently. This was an overnight study a couple weeks ago, and this was the, let's see, one of these was the, the neck CT, this was. So this was a neck CT angiogram. The patient came in, altered mental status. This was a stroke CT. And you'll see that there was the, the neuroradiology, uh, the fellow question whether this was a dissection or not in the descending aorta. And you can see that 
you know, in some areas I could see where people might think it's a little bit more well-defined, but of course, when you actually look at it on, you know, more of a reasonable window, you see even these, the, the lowest that it gets is like 120 Hounsfield units. And as we see, as you scroll down to, you'll see that it just kind of amor morphs into like nothing here. And then there's very little contrast. So we're kind of at the early edge of the bolus and the heart is, the left ventricle is moderately dilated. So we assume this patient has a reduced ejection fraction. And so they were quick to do a follow-up dissection protocol CT. As you can see, this is about 14 minutes later. I think the patient was still on the scanner and they just set up for another bolus of contrast. And you can see that there's nothing there, that this is just another good example of aortic smoke in a patient that has a reduced ejection fraction. Very nice, like that leading edge phenomenon, you call it. Yeah, yeah, I think if you look at it. Leading edge of the bolus. And there was actually a, a recent article in the in the latest email blast from, from radiology about uh, discussing contrast timing kinetics for aorta and uh, how personalizing the timing can improve the contrast opacification. They don't specifically discuss flow artifacts, but you know this is one of the issues, I think, when you scan too early, that you just end up with this mixing, especially along the undersurface of the aorta. Very nice example. On that. Nice case. So, all Very right, nice. I'll hand off there. All right, thank you. All right, Seth, welcome back. You wanna, do you have any cases yeah. to show? Sure. Sorry, it's been a been a while. Um, this is a nice one cine diagnosis here. Um, this is a twenty something year old guy who's just having a fib. No, no history of anything. Um, he's got a. You can see he's got a pacer AICD in, but most conspicuously, he has um, the left main arising from the pulmonary artery here, and with these. Um, Alcapa cases where uh, the um, that survive into adulthood. I mean, they have this really profound collateral flow where you can actually get. If I a second reset this and let me this stop the cine real quick. Um, you get this really robust collateral flow between the uh, right sided circulation. So. Uh, the RCA, which is quite large. And uh, if you did a cath on this and there wasn't all this metallic artifact, you would actually see the LAD coming underneath and anastomosing with the um, RCA and additionally the circumflex anastomosing with this large posterior lateral ventricular branch and then retrograde filling the LAD and then filling the LAD territory and dumping into the um, PA. So it acts like just a big fistula and that's why all the coronaries are so large. So this is just a nice, um, you also get collaterals through the um, acute marginal branches. And if there's a conus, occasionally collaterals through the conus. It's just a really nice case of Alcapa. The other thing that's interesting about this, which has been described are two things. One is the, um, as you would expect, because of the reduced flow in the um, LAD territory, uh, the whole left main territory, because it's being basically fed through a fistula, is that not surprisingly, uh, we get some hypokinesis here of the LAD territory. So you can see the RCA territory is pumping pretty well and the LAD territory is not. So presumably it's chronically ischemic. Um, and then additionally, what's also been described is this kind of calcification here. It's in the left circumflex territory, uh, yeah, diagonal circumflex, depending on, on the patient's anatomy. Uh, and this is thought, this subendocardial calcification, this is thought to be due to chronic ischemia. Uh, in mm -hmm. these patients. So kind of a nice case of, uh, you know, Al Kappa, where a guy, fortunately, when he was born or early in life, developed some really robust collaterals that allowed him to survive undiagnosed till now. Um, the yes. next case I have is this case, which is one of those. So patient has a pacer, looks fine. Um, I'll show you the follow-up. Still kind of looks fine to me. I, I wouldn't have commented. It, it's moved. So if I put the two side by side, you would see that its position has changed a little bit on the lateral. Um, it, it just has this weird configuration here, but I, I still wouldn't have probably mentioned it uh, beyond saying it's a little bit shifted in position and now has a little bit of curvature here, but she came in with chest pain and um, the CT is pretty 
impressive. So the reason she came in chest pain and kind of discomfort is that this thing has gone into the chest wall. So the AICD has lodged all the way into her intercostal muscles and was causing uh, some pain and some like it was going off and basically causing discomfort. So you can see this thing has gone way out here into the chest wall. And I've included, you know, the cines. Um, I, I have a bunch of cine uh, clips showing this. And I also included the retrospective data if you ever wanted to uh, kind of do it. So that's just a nice classic case of this. And this that, that, that was a defibrillator or a pacer? I didn't see the first imaging. Uh, I think it was a pacer. I'm sorry, I said defibrillator. She was having chest wall pain and discomfort, so it's just uh, sorry. It's just a pacer. I've seen them. Um, I've seen them pace the diaphragm. I was wondering if it was pacing her chest wall. It's you know sixty. It, might, per it, it may have been. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is. So, uh, one second. I'm trying to get. So this is a case of, and I'll just open this up real quick, see if this will come out okay. One second, see if I can play this. So this is a young kid with a rare diagnosis. The imaging isn't, whoop, the imaging isn't that fascinating, but the diagnosis is just one of those things you hear about, but just don't, I've never seen a case before. So the only real finding is that he's hypertrophied uh, and his, um, Delays are abnormal, um, and you can see that there's this delayed enhancement uh, in the inferior lateral and anterior lateral segments mid-myocardial. And recently, I showed a case, or a few months ago, I showed a case of uh, Anderson Fabry's disease with this, but uh, this is not. This is a case of someone with Dannon's disease. Albert, Albert, um, so, anyways, so this is a case of Dannon, like. Path proven. He's known to have Dannon's disease. So this is myocardial involvement with Dannon's. With Dannon's Wait, that, is that, that's a kind of yogurt, isn't it, Dannon? What I mean, what is what? this? It's a lysosomal storage process. Um, when you do the tissue mapping on it, it's not uh, fat attenu. It's not fat signal. Uh, you don't get the T1 uh, um, degradation, the rapid T1 degradation like fat. It's it's more consistent with. Uh, fibrotic myocardium. I'm not sure exactly what the etiology is of the myocardial fibrosis. It's just it's a skeletal muscle, uh, or it's a, it's a skeletal and cardiac muscle lysosomal storage disorder. It's just known that there you get cardiac involvement. And it's spelled D-A-N-N-O-N. -N is that right? I think it's D-A-N-O-N. Thank you. And then, lastly, I don't even remember what this case was, but it was something interesting. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have brought it over. Let's see here. Oh, no, this is a cool case. And I, I know we've all seen cases like this. This is just one of the nicer examples of this I've seen. So here's this guy who has this. And the question is, you know, what do you do when you see something like this? Um, I think most people say, oh, it's a cyst. Yeah, there's a little bit of soft tissue or scarring around the edge. But you know, here's this lesion. The patient has actually some uh, other ground glass nodules. She is a smoker, uh, and this thing gets followed. And as you would assume, given that I'm showing it, it's really Im impressive what happens to it. Um, so here's this other lesion. She had developed some other malignancies, but this thing really Wait. blossomed in terms of developing tumor around the edge of it, and just turned into this fulminant, really aggressive um, adenocarcinoma. So, uh, you know, we all talk about like cystic lesions that get that, you know, you have to be careful and that there's certain ones that definitely have that um, appearance where there's something wrong about it. Uh, this one, you know, maybe would um, kind of raise your, some things that may raise your flags, but not many, not too many on this. Uh, except that it's multi-loculated and maybe a minimal amount of soft tissue along. So here it was originally. Um, you know, maybe a minimal amount of tissue along the edge. But other than that, it looks pretty, maybe down here. Same thing with that one in the lingula, too, the smaller one. I mean, they're both scary because they both yeah. look 
this one would bother me more uh, because of just this, but I agree. I mean, it, it just looks sure. like emphysema with just some schmutz around it. But this one really, um, I saw this in, in tumor board and I was like, whoa, that's actually... And then I have, a, you know, a pet showing that not surprisingly, it's, it's, it's not a happy lesion. Um, so it's just one of those nice cases of a cystic, uh, kind of a cystic tumor that grows uh, progressively along the edges. But um, I've just, not seen are... one, Seth, with a cyst that big. I've seen them where, the, you know, the cyst is the dominant component initially, but that's, that thing's huge, the cystic component. On the first, on the first one or the last one? The first one. Yep. Yep. That's you know typically it's, it's the the little like you said the little cyst with a nodule by it you kind of yeah. get worried about or even if there's just yeah. a little bit of thickening. But this. So one, that's what I'm saying. Like I would look if, if this was the only if this was the only finding I would say oh it's a little probably yeah. some old lung in, you know old infection or something right. just a little scar along the edge, and and that would be it. Um, but. Yeah, that's not, yep. not what it was. <laughs> no boy. Yeah, that's all one can say. Yep. Oops. <laughs> all right, those are my cases. All right, thank oh, you. Oh, and Travis, I was looking up. So they do call it um, isolated, according to the surgical literature, if the PDA is still is open or closed. Okay. So, but that's just one paper I found. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Up? Yeah. Thank you. Who's up next? I've got a couple. All righty. <clears throat> so <clears throat> here's a person with bubbly lung bases and uh, situs inversus and um, abnormal sinuses. Not looking very happy. And um, an abnormal CT scan. I sort of thought the CT might might be abnormal based on the chest radiograph. This was prone imaging. I've just flipped it over here for display uh, with really pretty fierce bronchiectasis, especially in the most dependent parts of the lung, probably with some uh, mucus or pus in a lot of these airways. And it's, it's anterior because the person is prone. So this is, as you would expect, ciliary dysmotility and with situs inversus, so cartaginer. Um, syndrome. A uh, stellar example, this person got a uh, lung transplant. And, um, you know, the dysmnogenic part of this is the air trapping. So this, I don't have expiratory views to show you on this particular scan, but you can see the mosaic attenuation. So the bronchiectasis, you know, makes people a little bit of short of breath, um, but it's actually the most dysmnogenic component is the air trapping here. Um, so um, let's just bring that out here. The mosaic attenuation. So the amount of air trapping actually goes with the um, the problems in uh, gas exchange. It's like cystic fibrosis. The same same regard. It, the bronchiectasis is what catches our eye, but it's really the air trapping that goes with the bronchiectasis that um, makes them more dyspneic and lowers their oxygen. So <clears throat> then I want to show you a series of cases of of uh, interesting findings on exam sent to me for B reading. So. The thrust of this exam, which came from Indiana, uh, was is there any asbestos uh, abnormality in the chest? And there's atelectasis, low volume because of obesity, and then very dramatic uh, histoplasmosis related lymphadenopathy here with calcification. So last week I showed a case of presumably milk of calcium. This one could just be diffusely calcified. I'm not sure that this is milky. In this person, these are these are chunkier, firmer-looking nodes than the case I showed last week. But again, you can really get giant lymphadenopathy from histoplasmosis. And um, this Indiana case, last week's case was also from the Midwest. You know how Here's old another it was, David? I think there was a big outbreak of histo. I think it was like in '79 or '80 in Indianapolis. Like a hundred thousand yeah. people got when they were doing highway digging and stuff. Uh huh. Oh, okay. Because well, to, to get I, the, the ones I've seen, I mean that I, to get lymph nodes that big, I guess you'd either have an, a robust immune response or a, a pretty big uh, an, 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 antigen load. Yeah. Okay. So juicy nodes, 
And then here's another B reading case that was sent to me. And this, this fellow is uh, hunched forward and he has some apical scarring. He also got this more lordotic view here. So he's got scarring at the apex here. I called him up to talk about this. I wondered whether this could be TB up here or something like that. And I was kind of looking at his spine at the same time I was talking. I don't have a lateral view, but I was thinking, could this be ankylosing spondylitis? And I, when I spoke to the uh, people who sent, sent this exam, they said, yes, indeed, the man has ankylosing spondylitis. So I've been looking for my entire career for cases of apical scarring caused by ankylosing spondylitis because it's one of the first things that the residents trot out on differential diagnosis. And yet I've seen maybe one case so far in my entire career, and this may be my second case. Now, on the other hand, this could be TB or it could be atypical mycobacterial infection too. I wish it were more symmetric and I would be happier saying that this upper lung scarring is uh, perhaps the scarring that goes with ankylosing spondylitis. It does have a nice juxtaphrenic peak forming here to go along with the scarring up here and perhaps okay. this hyalur vessel is being elevated. So if it's not TB or atypical mycobacterial infection in this guy who doesn't probably cough very effectively, then maybe it's uh, upper lung scarring from ankylosing spondylitis. Okay. Um, by the way, let me just talk about juxtaphrenic peak. This is one of the topics that I brought up in that Los Angeles meeting about things that are not what you thought. The juxtaphrenic peaks have been attributed in the original description were attributed to traction on the pulmonary ligament, uh, but it's actually traction on an inferior accessory fissure. And you can see the little peak goes here, and then there's this thin line going up toward the hilum here, which is the inferior accessory fissure. Wish I had a CT on this case. Now. I may eventually have one, but I don't right now. That would also show traction on the inferior accessory fissure as a cause of juxtaphrenic peak. So the pulmonary ligament itself is in, in the mediastinum adjacent to the esophagus, it's not sitting out here along the diaphragm, so it's not going to be a cause of this. That original description uh, was before there was CT, and so, you know, it was, uh, it was kind of a guess. So there was a lot of interest in the pulmonary ligament at that time, but CT clarified this is actually traction on inferior accessory fissure. Okay, so maybe scarring, upper lung scarring from ankylosing spondylitis, maybe something more mundane. Then here's another uh, one of these B reads sent to me. Um, and this person has this progressive massive fibrosis pattern here, but does not have any uh, hard dust exposure to implicate silicosis or coworkers pneumoconiosis, but does carry a diagnosis of sarcoidosis. So here's advanced sarcoid with PMF pattern, advanced stage four sarcoid. Um, and um, very dramatic finding. You can see this person <clears throat> is entitled to be very short of breath. It's got low lung volume and this peripheral emphysema that um, forms where the uh, lungs are being drawn so strongly forward, it just stretches out the lung into this emphysematous peripheral pattern. Hmm. So um, the B reading business is uh, pretty mundane and pretty boring. And then every once in a while, cases like these pop up and it keeps it interesting. <laughs> and then uh, back to uh, our cases here, this fellow has um, lung fibrosis and um, you can see that it's fairly fine and it is basal predominant and it seems to be peripheral here, uh, it does have some playing of costophrenic angle and then has um, a CT scan that shows, again, fibrosis. A lot of it's peripheral, but then if you look at it down here, it seems to have some subpleural sparing. It seems to be more central around, more peribronchial with subpleural sparing. So he's, one starts to become skeptical of uh, whether this is a good UIP pattern for IPF. And then there's a fair amount of uh, mosaic attenuation going on here too. We have these lobules, and I think that actually is clear on the coronal views that we have some um, mosaic attenuation going on here, these patches of relative lucency. And then in the bases, uh, again, lobular distribution of more lucent, um, more lucent lobules here, but nice lobular boundaries. So this is that level of air trapping at the bronchiolar level. So um, <clears throat> our pulmonologists were finally consulted on this case, our ILD specialists and I told him that I thought this was 
based on the air trapping, uh, mosaic attenuation, presumed air trapping, that this would be a chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And it turns out that this man has birds. Uh, he has a bird that I'd never heard of before called a sun conure, S-U-N-C-O-N-U-R-E. So I've never heard of a sun conure before. Evidently, it's something related to parrots and stuff like that. I, if I had more time, I would have pulled up a nice picture of a sun conure for you. But this is uh, now that he carries a diagnosis of pre presumed chronic HP due to his bird exposure from sun conures. Mm, it's a kind so, of parakeet. <laughs> has anybody heard of this before? What? It's a kind of parakeet. It's, have you seen? Have you heard of it before? I heard of it one time before. Um, there's somewhere I think uh, in Central or South America, but yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Um, that air trapping is such an important finding. And then I think the NSIP distribution of lung fibrosis with a subplural sparing uh, is also good at taking this out of the UIP category. So we have this relative sparing at the very periphery of the lung. And the most intense stuff seems to be floating slightly uh, within that. So not quite at the periphery. Okay. So did Those he get are... rid of the bird? <laughs> you know, sometimes these people. They don't want to get rid of them. They're very attached to birds. I think birds, like birds and dogs, uh, generate real bonds with people. You know, these uh, these these uh, parrot-like birds are pretty intelligent, and they uh, they seem to form real relations with yeah. people. So it's it's a struggle sometimes. Or the person decides, you know, I'll I'll keep the bird. I'll just I'll just get a lung transplant. It'll be worth it. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks, David. All right, Howard. All righty. Okay, this is a, a very instructive case. Um, this is a person that has this radiograph there in 2016. And the follow-up is September of last year. Um, he is dramatically hyperinflated and the degree of hyperinflation is severely increased over this period of time. Um, I can't remember when I saw a diaphragm so flattened where one can see the attachments, the costal attachments of the diaphragms. That is very dramatic. So here is the uh, CT. And let me bring in the thin cuts for you. I'll just scroll through that. This, which is a new finding, I don't know what it is, but it's, I don't think, necessarily pertinent to the whole case. But this is what these lungs look like, so I'll just go through it once, give you a feel for the heterogeneity of lung attenuation in his lungs. And the lower lungs look like that where they're very overinflated. I'll just make the same MIP, MIP, excuse me, and just scroll through it again. There are a couple of areas in which we have some dilatation of proximal generations of segmental bronchi. I think this is a mosaic attenuation pattern, but it's mostly black. You know, the areas that are white are not really there, but it's that kind of flavor where I think the lungs are abnormal and there's bronchial dilatation. Now, I want to show you something that's really interesting here. So we don't do volumetric expiratory CT. We still do step and shoot, which means that in between each of these expiration images at these levels I'm showing you is a separate instruction on the part of the CT technologist to take in a deep breath, blow your air out. And if you look at the lung volumes and the appearance of the lungs, they don't seem to have changed at all from the inspiration. So if the instructions were appropriate, that in and of itself is very abnormal because the lung volumes have not reduced. We don't even see a hint of movement of posterior membrane. So that, by inference, is also very consistent with substantial airway obstruction. 
So I'm going to show you his PFT. So I want to go and first show you that this is what a normal volume time curve looks like on spirometry. So typically, of course, most of the volume is expelled rather quickly within a second. And then typically you get a plateau in the curve which represents numerically FVC. But this person, if you look at his curve here, you can see that many seconds out, he is still trying to expel air from his lungs. He is very, very obstructed. And here is the note from the technician in the PFT lab, patient unable to achieve expiratory plateau. So there's a great correspondence between what we see on the expiration series too, and this very severe obstructive, obstructive airways disease, where it doesn't even plateau at all, all the way out to 15 plus seconds. So I think he has very severe bronchiolitis obliterans is my diagnosis. I don't think this is emphysema. Um, he's got a history of smoking, but it's not very extensive. But I think all things considered, I consider this very suggestive of severe constrictive bronchiolitis. Any comments? Um, no, I, I, I think you're right. I, I think it's uh, very severe. It's, it's just so severe that you, you don't, the mosaic, I mean, you can see the mosaic attenuation. It's just, it's subtle because there's more black lung than white lung or lighter lung. That's my interpretation is that it's so severe and so widespread that we don't have that easily discerned mosaic attenuation pattern. Howard, can you crank up the contrast and enlighten everything so we can... Okay. It out? Something like, maybe like that. Uh, so let's, let's make it a lot of contrast here. Like that? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it does look as if there's a lot of peripheral um, air trapping. So around the the backs of the lungs that are along the fissure and stuff like this. Um, keep on going down, yeah. You get a sense there may be some more, more mosaic attenuation here. I'll keep going down. And this is inspiration, right? This is not expiration? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Yep. Even in an area like this, David, I think I can still see vessels that are very small, but not otherwise super disturbed running through this lung anteriorly. But that's my, my interpretation of this. In his clinical presentation, of course, is that of severe, very severe obstructive airways disease, outflow obstruction. All right, let me show you this one. This is going to be a very strong, at this point, presumptive diagnosis, but I'll show you how this evolved. So this patient came in, he was previously healthy, apparently. Um, I think he was short of breath or some chest discomfort, was discovered to have a right pleural effusion that was tapped at some point showing some abnormal cells, but they couldn't define it any further. I'll show you the appearance now of the lungs because I didn't expect to see this, which is substantial interstitial lung edema. It's on both sides, it's asymmetric, but there are many septal lines in the lungs. There are peribronchial fluid cuffs there's subpleural interstitial edema. So extensive, but patchy, but both lungs are involved, not just the right lung where the pleural fluid is. There are some down here. So certainly ordinarily with a patient with a appearance like this in pleural fluid, that's got nothing to do with the heart. We think of among other things, lymphangetic tumor spread. It's not known to have a cancer. And certainly we think of lymphangetic tumor spread in the context of epithelial malignancies as a potential cause of this. 
Um, I will show you now that he's got findings um, in his bone marrow that are very suggestive of a myeloid malignancy. Um, you can see the report there. He's definitely got abnormal cells that they interpret as blasts or pro-myelocytes. And although he said it doesn't quite meet the criteria, whatever they use, he was concerned that it could end up being an AML, perhaps even in the near future. So he's got very abnormal cells there. So I think this may be a case of lymphangitic or lymphatic obstruction by a myeloid neoplasm. So here's a nice example, a uh, nice article I found, for example, about the various forms that these tumors can evolve the lungs. And certainly, at least these pathologists here recognize that sometimes one can get an appearance of lymphangitic, sorry, carcinomatosis in the context of myeloid tumors. And I think certainly that's what he has. I think it's very likely that he has lung and pleural involvement. So, uh, so I'll let how... you know in terms of follow-up, what, what turns out, but at this point in time, strong presumptive diagnosis of a myeloid neoplasm. Howard, was there any central lymphadenopathy that might be obstructing lymphatic? Um, not really. There were some nodes that were slightly big in some areas, but I was not that impressed by that. So there was some mild lymph node enlargement, definitely, mm -hmm. in some locations like there. And there were some, I think, they were cardiophrenic, like there, for example. But not, David, not large ones in the central portion of that right line. There is some subcarinal stuff. I, I, what I found before is that the subcarinal nodes are very potent in terms of um, generating pleural effusion. So um, he does have he does have lymphadenopathy. Back yes, there. some. Not here. You know, but uh, you know, I wonder uh, too. Uh, so Howard, is that is that um, is that just mottling in the fat, or do you, does he have infiltration of his uh, subcutaneous fat in his anterior mediastinal fat? His uh, pericardium is very smudgy. Do you think there's uh, do you think there's uh, abnormal there's infiltration of that intramediastinal fat? And how about is subcutaneous fat abnormal in this person, or is that the way your scans look? I that, think the subcutaneous fat I think is okay. Okay. I'll bet you he's got uh, this tumor infiltrating his um, his intramediastinum there, and I think he's. Probably got tumor all over the place. I think you're so it's probably in lung, but it's also in mediastinum and it's in nodes. Yeah, definitely nodes. I think one wonders about this over there, right? But I must say, I didn't expect to see the septal lines as well as on the other side, like down there. I don't think the pathologist knows that he's got this pulmonary abnormality as well, suggestive of potential tumor obstruction of lymphatics, but. Mm -hmm. This may be a very interesting presentation of, of acute leukemia, myeloid leukemia. Yeah. So I'll keep you apprised of what happens to this person over time. Jeff, do you want me to go on or Jeff cases? I can show mine next week, whatever yeah, you I've got, whatever. I've got another, I've got two, uh, one quick one and one not so quick one, but I think that- Yeah, are... take us out, I'll show mine next time. All right. Okay, so, um... This is a case I ran into um, the other day, sort of an incidental finding. Um, but uh, one of the things when we're looking at the airways, you know, we look at the branching patterns. And normally when we're oh, – hold on. Am I sharing my screen yet? I may not have hit play. Yeah. You, yeah. See, you see a CT? Okay. Um, you know, we should see – shortly after the carina, we should see the right upper lobe bronchus, usually right under the azagous vein. There's azagous. And you'll see in this case there's no upper lobe bronchus. And then you say, well, is it absent? Well, not really. It's right here. And uh, the next thing to, re to, to realize here, let me change the window, is the um, relationship of the airways to the bronchi. And you'll notice that both of these bronchi go under the artery. So these are hyperarterial bronchi. So this is a patient with, um, let me make a minip of this. There we go. Of left pulmonary isomerism. So there's two morphologically left morphological left lungs with upper lower lobes, lingulas, and hyperarterial bronchi. And 
it's usually this was an incidental find. This was a older patient. It was a cancer follow up looking for Mets. And um, it's only important if they're going to do surgery or if you're going to do bronchoscopy. I do have radiographs, and you know, in retrospect, one could probably make some observations. Um, you can see the, the vessel crossing over the bronchus on the right, and then the lateral, the normal relationships are going to be a little bit different if it's a well centered lateral, and that you're not going to see the right upper and left upper lobe bronchi separate from each other. I don't know if. David or Howard has anything to add about that? So, so does he have any um, any findings in the upper abdomen? No. I'm trying to remember whether polysplenia goes with yeah. polysplenia. Polysplenia and, and azagous continuation of the IVC, neither of which uh, she has. I think she had a renal cell cancer. That's what that was related to. But normal IVC, normal yeah. spleen. So, yeah, this was an isolated finding. And this was an older patient, I think in her 60s, if I recall. Uh, no other vascular anomalies, no anything, but just kind of just kind of cute. This case, I just just got sent while you were showing cases uh, by Tom, Lucy, and Muhammad, and it goes along with this case. So I thought I'd ha I just had to show it when I saw the title. So this is a patient who's had um, some surgeries, and you'll notice the the radiograph is very abnormal. Uh, we have this funny looking mediastinum. We've got some um, surgical plates. And then if we look in the upper abdomen, you notice we don't see the usual stomach over here. So, okay. and then the aortic arch, of course, is here on the right. So now we start thinking of some situs anomalies, some congenital heart disease, and all sorts of fun stuff. And so I had to quickly dissect through this case to find everything. I'm sure I missed a bunch of stuff that's in there, but it's just really cool. And I've never seen this before. Um, I'll just get to the fun part. But So there's our right aortic arch. Um, it's been operated on before. I don't know what they did. I don't have much history. But look at these airways. Right in the middle, we have bilateral tracheal bronchi. I have never seen bilateral tracheal bronchi. I've never seen a real one on the left. And then we have branching that looks like uh, left lungs. So this almost this also looks like a, a left isomerism. I don't really see a middle lobe on on the right. Um, and then if you look at cardiac situs, it looks normal, left atrium, LVOT. So cardiac situs is normal. Um, SVC comes in on the right. And then there's this just very dilated and tortuous uh, azagous vein. I don't know why the, if these are collateral pathways from something. And then you'll see there's looks like situs inversus on the, in the abdomen. You've got liver over here. Uh, it doesn't look quite normal. And then you've got stomach wrapped around back posteriorly on the right. And uh, there's pancreas, and this has asplenia from what I can tell. I don't see a spleen anywhere. And so that's associated with bilateral right-sidedness, but I think... So, just what's the tracheal bronchus then? Is that, isn't that the right upper low bronchus? I and guess. Then you have a long, and I, then you have a long bronchus intermediate, so maybe it is bilateral right-sidedness? Yeah. Well, that's what I was trying to figure out, if these are hyparterial or epiarterial bronchi. And, you know, looking here, it's, it's a tough call. But because of the, I don't know if that's a tougher distinction to make because you have those tracheal bronchi. Right. I think that's a very good point. I think the tracheal bronchi uh, counts as the upper lobe bronchi. So this will be a, a right isomerism, which would explain the. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, that right. explains the azagus, the asplenia. Yeah, I guess that would do it. And also, it looked like there was a retro aortic brachiocephalic vein, too. Yeah, just, just for, uh, what it on. Let's go. Right there. Oh, yeah, there it is right there, diving underneath. Well, that's, yeah, it sort of dives. Well, or is that just the SVC being pushed out of the way? No, I don't know. Maybe it's just wimpy. Oh, there's a little collateral coming through right there. Oh, no, you're right. You're right. Look at that. Yeah, it's just getting squished underneath. Well, that's really Wait. cool. But I, I've never seen bilateral tracheal bronchi or whatever. Or, before I've never seen bilateral right isomerism. Has anybody seen it before? No. So I, I think uh, you know really? the, uh, the pulmonary arteries come down alongside the airways, uh -huh. not not going over the top. So yeah. it really is right sided pattern. Well, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Look yeah. at that right there. Yeah, it's running right next to it. And same here, it's running right next to it. Yeah, because okay. usually they have severe congenital heart disease, and with the asplenia, I mean, they present in childhood with big problems and 
bad infections. That liver doesn't look normal, but no. Well, that's really cool. Yeah, the severity of the cardiovascular findings and the asplenia with right-sided isomerism usually limits lifespan, so we tend not to see them as adults as a general sort of short rule of thumb. Yeah. But this person had heart surgery, so this this person, you know, did probably have severe congenital heart disease and got an operation. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what they did because it looks like the septa. They, they did something. Maybe there was anomalous venous return because it looks like they did something down by the IVC. I don't see anything that looks like a septal patch or an arterial switch. But those pulmonary veins come together in the midline. Right. Uh, as it, right. That's kind of, that's slightly strange. Maybe it was a total anomalous pulmonary venous return. Because there's yeah. a clip right there too. I bet that's what it was. Hmm. Well, I'll see if I can get any information. Yeah. But well, there, there, that was perfect. It timed perfectly with my other not less interesting case, but just something we see every so often. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. I'll send that one Thanks around so and you can dissect it even more. Maybe you can figure out, maybe there's other stuff going on. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Great cases. All right. Thank Talk you. to you next week.